Hey, good morning, good afternoon. I'm Brent Halpern, the Scientific Director of the AI Horizons Network, and this is our weekly um, seminar series. Today we have a talk on sentence embedding alignment for lifelong relation extraction. This is by Hong Wang of UC Santa Barbara. Um, Hong is a first year PhD student in the CS department there. Uh, he's interested on focusing on lifelong learning and few shot learning of fundamental problems such as relation extraction. Uh, I will uh, let everybody know that you're coming in muted into the, uh, to the WebEx, uh, in which case we would generally suggest that we hold questions for the end. Uh, if you do need to interrupt, you need to unmute yourself or you can post a question in the chat if you want to make sure to remember it. Uh, the unmute button is in the menus down at the bottom with the little red microphones and the chat is one of those, is a speech bubble down in the menu at the bottom of the screen. So without further ado, uh, Hong Wei. Hi. Hi. Thank you for the introduction. So. It's my pleasure to uh, share with you our NECO paper, Synthesis Embedding Alignments for Lifelong Relation Extraction. This is joint work with Wen Han Xiong, Mo Yu, Xiao Xiao Guo, Si Yu Chang, and Wei Lian Wang. So, first, let's first talk about the task of relation extraction. This task aims to automatically extract the relation for a given sentence and it has been widely applied in many downstream tasks, such as uh, question answering. So here, here is an example given a question, where was Obama born? The system could uh, distract the relation mentioned in this sentence, which is born in. And uh, we can use the head entity Obama and the extracted relation born in to query in the knowledge graph so that we can get the answer for this question. Although the relation restriction has been widely applied in many real world applications, but they have conventional approaches to solve this problem, you only assume a fixed training data, and they apply once and for all training pipelines to solve this problem, which we think uh, we'll have some problem under the case that new relations are emerging very quickly. So what can we do if there are new relations? Conventional approaches may have to retrain a new, a new model to, in order to fit in the new data that's like this. So they, may, they can mix the data from new relations uh, with the existing training data and the retrain the whole model on all the data. This approach is durable, but uh, of course it's not best, especially under the case that if you have a lot of training data, you may training, retraining a new model may, uh, may spend a lot of time, or if you have new relations every hour or every day, retraining your model will also uh, cause a lot of time. So we think one possible solution to, for this problem is to apply lifelong learning approaches. So what is lifelong learning? Um, lifelong learning aims to solve the problem that um, for the, for under, the, under the case that new relations or tasks are coming in. So it trains a model to learn a set of tasks in sequence without forgetting the knowledge learned on previous tasks. For example, here is a uh, model F and uh, there are a set of uh, tasks, task one, task two, and two, task N. And the model F will like, first learn on task one and then on learn, learn on task two. So at each type, the model F only needs to learn on the data from a new task. Compared with retraining a new model on all the data it needs, it needs much less computation and save a lot of time. But uh, here is another example to show how it works for our relation instruction. So consider we have three relations here and we have a randomly initialized model F. So 
the model F will first be trained on the next first relation, born A, and we get a new model. And when we have a new relation, we train the model on the data from the new relation, like nationality, and we get another new model. And when we have another new relation, we train the model on the new relation. And after we train the model on all the relations, we can test the, the performance of the model on all the relations and to, to measure its performance. So lifelong learning uh, is actually natural for human beings. For example, when you learn a new language such as HTML, you will not forget the knowledge or skills you learned about C++. But uh, for machines, especially for the widely used model neural networks, natural learning is a hard thing. We know that the neural networks store stores knowledge in the, uh, in its weight. But so when when we use the neural network, adapt the neural network to a new task, it uh, its weight may be will be changed in order to fit in the new task. And the changed parameters maybe will no longer fit for previous tasks. Like when we learn on task two, and the new model will maybe no longer fit for task one. And when we learn on the new task, task three, the adapted parameters may no longer fit for previous tasks. This phenomenon is called catastrophic forgetting. And it's severe for the neural network, uh, neural network models, since we use uh, decent, uh, great and decent to update the parameters to fit the new task. And the update the parameters may can be easily, um, maybe not, maybe not, uh, maybe not uh, fit for previous task anymore. So what can we do to make the neural network models work under the under the lifelong learning setting. There are some previous works. Like one way is that maybe we can we can adjust the learning rate for the parameters and we decrease the learning rate of the parameters that are important for the previous tasks. This approach is called EWC. So they use the facial information metrics to measure the importance of a parameter to previous tasks. And so they add another loss on the loss function. And uh, if the uh, parameter um, the, is uh, far away from, from the original parameter and its facial information is large, it will cause incur a large penalty on the loss function. So by Introducing such such a loss function here, it will the it will decrease the learning rate on the important parameters since the loss will be large if they they change that uh, parameters. And you may notice that uh, such a uh, an approach didn't uh, apply use any memories or samples from previous tasks, but uh, if we have memories and we can save some samples from previous tasks, we can do better. So, um, and this is actually a reasonable assumption since uh, the we have we can store some samples since we have the memory. And uh, for humans, we it's also natural to use the previous experience to help us to learn our new task. This is a, a, an approach that published in NIPS 2017. It's called GM. So the key idea is that we save some samples for each previous task. And when we, when we learn on the new task, we hope the updated uh, per, um, gradient, uh, like the details, will not only benefit on the new task, but also benefit uh, on previous tasks. One assumption that they use is that they think if uh, the updated per, uh, gradient is uh, uh, the angle between the updated gradient and the gradient on previous task is uh, within 90 degrees. So then 
the things update gradient will also benefit that task. So they, they write their optimization problem in this form. They hope after uh, after computing all the grade, the gradient on the new task and the gradient on the previous task, they hope they the the computed um, updated gradient could be most similar to the gradient on the new task. And the updated gradient will also benefit uh, the previous task. So the angle is uh, or the product between the update gradient and the previous the gradient and previous task is uh, larger than zero. This kind of approach has a problem is that there is computationally expensive because every time I update the gradient, I will not only need to compute the gradient on the on the new task, but also I need to compute the gradient on previous tasks. And the, as the time increases, we may have much more previous tasks, like hundreds or thousands of previous tasks. At this time, each update will become slow since we have many, many tasks that need to compute gradients. So one, can we do faster than GM? The answer is yes. So the AGM is meaning of propose to solve this problem instead of computing the gradient on each previous task. They propose to mix the data from previous tasks together and uh, regard all the previous tasks as a mixed task. And they sample data from the all the previous tasks and uh, they so they only have one constraint that uh, the updated gradient should be in the right angle which is the, the gradient on the previous tasks. And they can have a closed for solution for this problem. So compared with GM, AGM only, only, only need to compute so one additional gradient on, on the data from all previous tasks and it's much faster and it can achieve similar performance as GM. But we're wondering if is the, the operation of projection really necessary or not. So if we look at the projection operation, it what what it what it really does is that uh, it aims to find uh find the gradient that is most similar to the current one and will not violate much on the previous one. So in other, in other words, is that the update gradient will most benefit the current task. And we think such a constraint on previous task maybe is, is not strict in, enough since it only requires the angle is within 90 degrees and uh, maybe the through this way this, this performance will also drop. So here we propose our uh, another simple approach to this problem. Instead of um, project the gradient, we use the average of the gradient on the new task and the gradient on previous tasks to update our model. And uh, here it's uh, worth to mention that there are two ways to sample previous tasks. One way is that we can sample from all previous tasks by mix, mixing the data, all the data together. Another way is that we can sample one previous task and uh, use the data from that particular task. The performance are similar for the two approaches, uh, but one problem is that the first approach may not be appropriate on the same case. For example, for some tasks may have for different input, input dimensions. So under this case, you can't mix the data from different tasks together into a, into a single batch. So at this time you have to, you have to choose the second approach to train a date train a, so in the same batch it, it only has the data from the same task.
And here we propose two, ben two new benchmarks for the lifelong relation instruction task based on the data set of few relation and the questions. We use the k means to cluster on the relation name, the, the name of the relations into, into several groups and uh, and like for example on a few relation data set we cl we cluster the 18 relations into 10 groups and uh, we cluster the relations for simple questions into 20 relations. Uh, each group of relations is regarded as a task in our setting. So how good is our simple baseline the EMR? Uh, we compare this baseline with the GM and AGM on our, our proposed lifelong relation distraction benchmark. It turns out that the, this simple baseline also performs GM and AGM. Given on the pop, popularly used benchmarks in computer vision, like MNIST, Rotation and MNIST permutation, or our CIFA once um, 100. Our approach actually has for competitive performance at the DELPS Arts method GM. So we can see that actually the projection is not necessary for, for the case that under our view. Left on relation direction task, the AGM actually performs much worse than our our the simple baseline that do not use the projection. The problem is, can we do better than the simple baseline? So let's have a closer look of the stochastic forgetting. Here you you can see the dots on the plot plot as the embedding for a sentence. And uh, when we learn on a new task, the embedding for the for the sentences of the previous task will be moved to a new position, like the pink dot here. So since the embedding for the previous task changed, their performance will be will dropped as well, and this will cause so the case to forgetting. And where we are thinking about, can we explicitly model the change of the embedding and uh, so that we can move them back to their original position where they have best performance. Here we propose to add another oper operation called alignment. So this is a the prediction of for the sample for the sentence in previous tasks changed. We use the alignment operation to map the change the prediction back to their original prediction. So here the red dot is the aligned prediction, which is much more closer than, than to the original prediction than the than the new prediction after we're training on the new task. So through this way, we hope since we since we aligned the embedding for previous tasks back to the original position, we hope their performance will not drop much. So specifically, how to achieve this? Here, here is our alignment objective. In this object function, there are many two parts. The first part is the classification error of our problem. And we add uh, an additional nodes, which is called distortion nodes. This nodes arms to minimize the distance of the of the embedding uh, for the sentence to their to the save the to their previous embedding. So this nodes and the purpose of this nodes is to align the embedding back to their original position. In order to train the objective, we propose to use two-step training. The first step is that we train the model on the new task and the saved samples to minimize the classification error. 
and after that, the embedding for the synthesis may be altered. And uh, in the second step, we use the explicit alignment to align the embedding for the for the samples from previous task to their original position. Here, this is the model we use for the relation extraction task, and the lower part is the model to to predict the embedding for a sentence or the resonation. And based on that, we add the alignment model to do the explicit alignment. So in the first step, we train the basic model to minimize the classification error. And after that, we do we train the alignment model to minimize the distortional error to to map the embedding uh, for the for the synthesis in previous task back to their original original embed. And uh, it's worth to mention that the key component in our algorithm, um, which is that we need to select samples for each task. Here we we use uh, or propose to use k means to choose samples. For example, if you if we need to choose 15 samples for each task, we will first cluster all the samples in that task into 50, 50 groups, and uh, the nearest sample to the center of each group will be chosen to save in the memory. For the experiments, we uh, for the experiments we compare our method with several best methods mentioned before, like GM, AGM, EWC. Also, we compare with our method with the original baseline, which do not use any additional operation. So we, we can see that our method performs much better than other baselines. And on the simple questions, the benchmark, our method didn't have much job and uh, maintain the high accuracy as we see more tasks. So here are the x the x axis is the number of the tasks we have seen. So and the y axis is the average accuracy on all the observed tasks. And uh, this table uh, leads to the concrete numbers uh, accuracy of uh, the, this method at the next uh, at the last step. Um, and as you can see that um, the two key components of our method, the sample selection and the alignment model, both of them have the, have some improvement on the basic EMR model. And uh, using the whole model, we'll, we'll have the best performance under most cases. Also, we we conduct some experiments to compare different methods of to select samples. So we compare our method to that of K means to the random selection, which here is the EMR only, and uh, we also compare it with another approach called SARL, which which choose samples that best best appro approximate the distribution of the original data. So we say that our our K means solution has the best performance in our experiment. So the main for the conclusion, um, in this paper we introduce the lifelong learning into relation extraction tasks. We think it's more practical since new relations are emerging or like emerging in many practical um, problems. And we propose a baseline called EMR, which which only which you which is quite simple that um, use the average of the gradient on the new task and on the gradient on the previous task to update the model.
Surprisingly, the, this simple baseline outperforms the current steps out method, EM and EWC. Um, based on the EMR method, we propose to use sentencing embedding alignment, which explicitly do the alignment in the embedding space to to recover the embedding for the for the for the previous task. Through this way, we we can see that it can better alleviate the catastrophic getting problem. So thank you for your attention and any questions. Thank you very much, Hung. I appreciate you giving that very clear talk. Um, reminder to questioners that you're going to need to unmute yourself, which is clicking on the little red microphone on the menu at the bottom of the screen, and that uh, the talk is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. So if you're from IBM, please keep your questions or comments non-confidential. Uh, I see Ho Chiao's un unmuted. You want to start? Uh, yeah. So this is a question from IBM Hello. Almaden. Yeah, we are oh. seeing a couple of people together here. <laughs> right. uh, okay. okay. Yeah, this is Sanjana. Um, so for selecting like samples from previous tasks, is there like a limit or a threshold on how many samples you get from previous tasks versus how many samples you keep from the current task so that it's also like task uh, relevant? Um, so do you mean how many samples we keep for each previous task? Yeah, each previous task versus like the current task itself so that they're still task relevant. Okay, um, so in our experiments, we keep like 15, 50 samples for each previous task. Uh, can you repeat that? Uh, so in our experiments, we we keep uh, 50 samples for each each previous task. 50 samples. Yeah, 50 samples for each previous task. So it's very small compared to uh, the whole data from that uh, that task, yeah. Uh, okay. In terms of percentage, how how would that be split? Sorry, um, could you repeat that? In terms of percentage, how would it be split across tasks? Is it the same for every task uh, compared to the current one? Uh, yeah. So for the current, uh, for the current task. Uh, so how much weightage do you give for each task uh, while you pick samples from it? Is it evenly distributed? Um, uh, never mind, I'll just send you an email later. But the next question was, like, how do you decide on the K and K means for each task? Uh, OK. So for the K means, uh, we conduct the k-means on the embedding, like, um, here, I can show. Mm. So here we use the embedding of, of our model to, to conduct the k-means approach. So, so like we use k-means on the embedding, uh, on the embedding of each sentence. Or, and we choose uh, like, um, and and then we choose like 15 samples for each previous task. We will cluster uh, the all the samples into 15 clusters and uh, choose the closest closest uh, nearest sample to the center and to store in the memory. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So was that was that that k size arbitrary or was it? somehow tuned to the data set? Uh, the, um, the K being how many clusters? Yeah. So I think it depends on uh, on your memory, um, how you um, how many data you decided to um, to, to to choose and to to store in the memory. So mm -hmm. yeah, so for, for example in our experiments we like uh, use 15 samples for each task, so we class it, cluster it into like 15 clusters. Yeah. 
Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Going once, going twice. All right. Uh, again, Hung, thank you very much for giving the presentation. Thank you to the folks who stayed on. We don't have a, um, a seminar scheduled yet for next week, so my guess is we probably won't, but if there will, we'll send it out via the usual mechanisms. Uh, our next schedule is June 24th, but I'm hoping that we'll have at least uh, a couple more between now and then, realizing that summer schedules are a little bit harder for everybody. So again, everyone, thank you very much, and thank you very much for doing the presentation. Thank you.